In Svalbard, Norway, one of the northernmost inhabited areas on the planet, it is illegal for you to die. Because if you die and you are buried there, your body will literally be preserved in ice. And so will all of the infectious microorganisms in your body. It's also illegal for you to give birth or have cats up there. In fact, beyond Svalbard is a town named Neolisun in which the only residents are researchers, no other humans. It is in this town that there are more than 20 research stations set up by around 11 countries, including India. And the scientific expeditions up there are mostly undertaken in the summer. Not just because it's slightly warmer, but because it is the only time you can actually see anything. Between October and January up in the North Pole, the sun never rises. It is always pitch dark. But in December 2023, a research team from India took up the first ever Indian winter expedition to the North Pole. And one of its participants was from our very own Bengaluru. Girish Bias from Bangalore Research Institute. I'm basically a Bangalore boy, um, born and brought up in Bangalore, and then uh, graduated with a degree in electronics and communication engineering from Bangalore University, and then uh, uh, been at RRI since 1995, and uh, currently I'm working as a research scientist uh, at RRI. And then I was leading the group, uh, leading a group of four um, uh, experimentalists who were uh, traveling for the first time uh, to carry out field experiments in uh, the Arctic region during winter time. It all started when the National Centre for Polar and Ocean Research, Goa, put out an announcement that they were going to be organising a winter expedition to the Arctic. NCPOR organises research in areas of polar science that aren't undertaken by any other agency in the country. The Himadri Research Station in Nialisun, in the Arctic, has been operational since 2008. But it has only seen summer expeditions so far. Girish was accompanied by three other Indian researchers, all of whom were studying the impact of Arctic events on the climate of the rest of the planet. Global warming is a big uh, issue around the world. And then there is something called Arctic amplification, is what I understood when I go, went there uh, talking to my other colleagues, uh, which means Arctic region is warming about three to four times faster than the global average. So there is this uh, thing that I regularly heard, what happens in Arctic does not stay in Arctic. People are trying to study what effect it has. For example, does it have any bearing on um, uh, India's monsoon? Girish himself is an engineer who is designing equipment to detect weak signals from the time that the first stars and galaxies were born. These signals, by the time they reach Earth, it comes to a frequency range of 40 to 200 megahertz. So we have a lot of um, other communication equipment operating in this, like uh, signals from FM radio stations and then um, TV stations and then various communication equipment operate in this frequency range. And these are um, kind of overwhelming our equipment and then uh, it is kind of, uh, it's becoming difficult to uh, get to the level of precision that we require to detect the signal. Okay. So we are always on the lookout for uh, pristine, very quiet uh, uh, sites around the world. Okay. So uh, to deploy the service equipment. In the evolution history of the universe, uh, the universe so there is one missing piece, uh, what we call as, uh, this is the least studied and understood uh, this phase of the universe when the first stars and galaxies form. By analyzing these signals, we'll be able to understand the, uh, what was the conditions that existed for the first stars and galaxies to form. When we really deploy our SARS equipment, and then again, like I mentioned, we don't want the um, uh, sun to be up in the sky and be part of our beam when we're collecting signal. So, uh, again, even when we go there, we deploy during great nights only. Okay. So, uh, we in fact prefer uh, uh, dark night was really advantageous to us. Uh, polar night was advantageous to us in that sense. Up until December 2023, SARAS, shaped antenna measurement of the background radio spectrum, had only been deployed in areas of the country where there are fewer radio signals, in parts of the Western Ghats, for example. This trip to the North Pole was the team's chance to figure out if the Arctic would be a good place to deploy the actual equipment. We have analysed and then uh, that's how we are able to say that the uh, New Orleans and area is promising for us to deploy service and we are just looking for uh, uh, the next opportunity to take the actual service equipment, deploy there and carry out science information. Why did Girish and his team choose the North Pole? 
Was the South Pole not an option? Yeah, if somebody said they are poles apart, the atmosphere it literally means Arctic is an ocean which is hemmed by land around it. Whereas Antarctica is different; it is a continent. It's a landmass, so it is a lot of ice, a layer of ice, and it is surrounded by uh, oceans. And then, if we have to talk about uh, our experiment, for example, it would be be interested in. Uh, uh doing the same experiment of radiative characterization and taking sars to antarctica yes we would be wanting to do that uh, simply because antarctica is a much bigger place and then more remote uh, than that is and there are fewer stations which operate around the year uh, india has one station which operates around the year so uh, maybe we would want to do this sars characterization and uh, if it is uh, uh, Before his trip in 2023, Girish, who had spent all of his life in a tropical country like India, knew that he was about to spend an entire month with absolutely no hint of sunlight. He had done all of his prep, yet it wasn't easy. So the first thing in the morning is what you think is okay. As soon as sun rises tomorrow, I can go out and see how nice the place is. Even though we knew that in our mind that there is not going to be sun, that is that was the initial feeling. That was for a couple of days, and then we got used to the fact, that, and then it really uh, kind of uh, set in our minds that okay, we are not going to see sunlight in this place for the time that we are going to be there for about twenty five more days. A day in the life of a researcher up in the North Pole, unlike what one might assume, isn't very different. You wake up at six, breakfast is at seven thirty, work till twelve noon, lunch till one, work till four thirty, dinner till five thirty, more work, and then bed. What's different is that meals happen as an international, multicultural community. You have about twenty 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 two odd institutions from ten uh, to twelve different uh, countries in the world. They're, we're all together there, and then uh, when you are there, um, it doesn't matter where you whether you are from Europe, or Asia. Or, uh, Any other continent, so uh, there's a lot of encouragement uh, to mingle with people, and then uh, dining area. There's always a note saying that please don't uh, do your uh, surfing and uh, talking over phone when you are here. Uh, you try and avoid that, and then speak and discuss with people, and then get to know what uh, uh, about their research, and then about their country, and then uh, culture and other things. So it's an opportunity to know more about people and their experiments. Another thing that's different is that every time you step out into the outdoors, you need to be very aware of the possibility of a polar bear attack. So, uh, you see, you know, also the settlement where all these buildings and people uh, live and uh, work. Okay, so within that settlement is going to be safe. So, uh, if you're trying to go out of that place, you need to be equipped with two things. One is a flare gun. Other one is a firearm, probably a rifle or something like that. You can carry a gun if you have a gun license from your country, uh, not necessarily from Norway or any other place. Otherwise, you can go with someone who has a has a gun license and then because someone can be part of this. Girish and his team are preparing for round two when they finally deploy the Saras equipment in the Arctic. If this experiment succeeds, we would essentially have a complete picture of the evolutionary history of the universe. So, uh, Incipior has again uh, uh, come up with a call for proposals. We have submitted our proposal. We do not want sun in our uh, when we are carrying out experiment. Uh, so again, maybe we prefer uh, polar nights again, which begins when it's from October twenty twenty four. The initiation of this experiment and scientists' willingness to experience life with no sunlight just to get to this goal is an indicator of just how far human beings have come in the advancement of our understanding of the world around us.